So many of you have done some of this already. Some of you have done more than others, but let's get to it. I'll go through quickly here because we've kind of covered a lot of this, but I want to make sure we have it all wrapped up and some of you might want to watch it again. Um, so this is a thematic uh, review lecture on the role of women uh, and women's rights in American history. Um, and we'll start before American history is American history and colonial the colonial uh, world. This is when we see the emergence of Republican motherhood. Uh, Republican motherhood is held up as the ideal uh, and it's very influential uh, in terms of uh, uh, translating the virtues of republicanism to children um, uh, to um, and, and to husbands I suppose for that matter. Um, sorry this is a hummingbird outside the window it's very incredible the world is, you know? Um, okay, so, sorry, I got, lost myself there. So it's women's role to instill Republican virtues, right, in the, um, in the children, in husbands. And again, I, this is the ideal, right? Our language we use matters. This is not actually necessarily something that is a, a reality, right? So obviously for upper class white women it's easier the the distance between the ideal and the reality is less um, because of circumstances um, women potentially are highly educated so then they can actually uh, be effective conduits for education for their children um, they have enough leisure time to engage in this kind of nurturing uh, behavior towards children, caring after a husband, etc. Um, needless to say, this is only white women, right? Um, this does not apply. There is no Republican motherhood for enslaved women. Um, enslaved women, right? That it's, this is not a luxury that they can uh, afford. And it's not a concept that is even applied to them. Um, even lower class white women. So again, if you get a DBQ, I'm sorry, if you get a DBQ on the exam and it's about women in American history, you immediately four main things that you can talk about. Rich white ladies, working class ladies, white and then black or non-white, right? Because also this is a, a term that's not applicable to say like Irish immigrants or something like that in the 1840s. So like, I am sorry, you want a nuance point, you've got a whole schema for nuance if you're going to talk about women in American history and any really any time period, right? So even if we go all the way to, um, you know, the second wave feminist movement in the 1960s, there's a difference between black feminist thought and white feminism in the 60s. There's a, a you know, elite kind of feminist movement and a working class feminist movement. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the colonial world here. Um, women do have to do a bunch of work on top of this, even the elite women, right, have all kinds of uh, tasks, duties, chores, jobs that they need to do in an agrarian mode of production. This is, I'm, I'm not trying to be some low-key Marxist here, as I said in class, this is the language our book uses. So you can talk to Henretta and them about the, the mode of production talk. So an agrarian mode of production is a fancy way of saying farm work. Um, in with farm work, it is patriarchal. There's no doubt about that. Women are subservient to men. Um, since the beginning of time kind of thing. Um, uh, however, just like we see when we have a division of labor, even if we go back to like the ancient world, um, when men start going out into like in earning wages or engaging in politics or diplomacy or something like that, you see the role of women being marginalized. So similarly here, right, in an agrarian mode of production, there's a certain parity between women's work and men's work because men just work out there in the field. They plow, they harvest, they tend to the crops, and then it's a woman's role to um, keep the kind of domestic economy of the home, to either do the cooking or over see the cooking to preserve the things that are being brought in to oversee right the dairy the smokehouse or the larder all of this stuff so there's a certain parity uh, equality in terms of the, the two kinds of labor that we're not going to see later. Once men start going out into the public sphere not in a, an agrarian mode of production but in a mode of production where wages are being earned, we don't see an equivalent valuation of women's labor, and we get 
more about hierarchy. This is that kind of thing where it's like when people talk about traditional gender roles, it's like, well, what are you talking about? Right? Because there's certainly far more equality in the gender roles of the late 18th century than there was between, you know, the 1950s. Right? So like, again, Childbirth is the number one killer of women in this time period. Uh, it's really, this is a since the beginning of time type thing. Very dangerous childbirth is. And I want to emphasize this point in the late 18th century, because by the time we get to the end of this slide, here's the last slide, and it talks about, let's show you the United States down here in the, in the basement with um, maternity leave. One of the reasons why a central locus of feminist um, uh, activism is around birth control, abortion, maternity leave, um, uh, uh, working, being treated as equals in the work uh, environment is because, if we look back here, this idea of childbirth being the number one killer of women is significant because women don't have control over their own bodies, right? And they can die through childbirth, especially in a time period where it's not uncommon to have five, six, seven kids more, even dozens, right? Um, of children, or it's not uncommon for men to remarry, remarry, remarry because their wives are dying in childbirth. So the idea that right women should have control over their own bodies and in particular their own, like when they're going to give birth, is a major kind of thing that we'll see emerging in later feminist uh, movements. American Revolution happens and it's a big win for Republican motherhood, so it's not just some theory. Right? Like in the colonial world, it's a theory, the same way people are reading like Montesquieu or Locke, right? It's theoretical. But now it's like, we got a republic, like a proper republic. So definitely Republican motherhood is going to be center stage in the early republic. Um, unfortunately, the more radical demands, like so famously Abigail Adams um, uh, implores John Adams to not forget the ladies when he and all the bros are growing down in Philly with the Constitutional Convention, they do forget the ladies. Um, but there are women who are demanding things like voting rights in the colonial world, um, and we just don't really see it. Um, uh, we'll see some exceptions to that rule throughout the course of these slides, but for the most part, no. Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution. If we're thinking industry and the United States and women, you're going to think of the Waltham Lowell system or Lowell system, the Lowell Mills in New England. They are textile mills. They are vertically integrated. Um, more on that when I talk about economy, but effectively, right, from the cotton harvest to the spinning to the creation of fabric, right, that's all all in one kind of uh, system. Um, long, long hours, long weeks. Uh, women live together with other women in these factory towns. And on the one hand, we can talk about this Lowell system as exploitative because it indeed is exploitative. And furthermore, as I have here at the top, it's exploitative because the reason these jobs exist is because the industrial textile system has put the cottage industries completely just blows them up, right? So these women, many of these women used to make textiles at home, make textiles in their communities, uh, and no, that industry is gone because it cannot compete with, with this major right, industrial production. What do women do who are out of work? Go work in the industry, right? Um, so, so that. Um, it is seen at, so that is the bad news, the exploitative elements of the Lowell system. But at the same time, this is fairly revolutionary, right? The idea that the, the classic narrative of a woman's life is you go from living with your father to living with your husband, right? And there's kind of, that's just the transition where, I mean, this is not like going off to college or something like that. Um, but it is a, like, this is kind of revolutionary, right? That women would go off and work in these mills in a Lowell system with other women, earn money, um, uh, is kind of revolutionary, right? So again, nuance is important, always important. On the one hand, it is an exploitative system. On the one hand, it has put cottage industries, you know, completely out of business. But at the same time, right, it's, it's a kind of revolution in how women interact uh, with the public sphere and with the economy. Um, highlights of the 19th century, right? So we have covered uh, the, uh, the word of the day uh, for the revolutionary generation is Republican motherhood. But then where do you go from there, right? So a lot of women say, well, voting, 
right, is obviously where you go from there. If we're so central to republicanism, if we're so central to translating virtue and values to young men, our sons, uh, or kind of policing our husbands, then why can't we be right? Why, why aren't we voting? Um, the Great Awakening, this is to say the second Great Awakening here, um, gives women actually more control over their own bodies in the 21st century. Really, 21st century, there's generally this notion that like, you know, religion and uh, female empowerment don't necessarily mix, right? More fundamentalist kind of sects of say Christianity or Islam or Judaism. Um, but that's not the case here because the Second Great Awakening actually gives women the ability to like use scripture, right? And, and God in heaven to, right, thwart sexual advances by men. Right. In the revolutionary period or even before the revolution, you see, right, teen pregnancy, quite common, um, women giving birth within nine months of their wedding day. Right. You get what happened there. Quite common. So actually, the Great Awakening and a awakening of religiosity gives women more control because it's like, right, it's not just saying no to sexual advances, but actually saying, like, you're, you're going to go to hell. Right. Like, that's a pretty powerful no. Right. So that virtue, again, another layer of virtue in this kind of religious uh, notion. Um, other women are pushing for more education. Um, obviously, education is going to give you more opportunity. Um, education is going to give you a, a help you better select a husband. Right. You don't just get whoever you get if you're smart enough and you're educated or if you have other options professionally or uh, personally, you're going to be more selective. So this is these are all ways in which women get more freedom in the 19th century. Mariah Stewart, pictured at right here, is a black American um, uh, advocate for women's rights. She's very, very influential over abolitionists such as um, David Walker, um, who wrote Walker's uh, His Appeal, a very well-known abolitionist uh, uh, um, publication. And then William Lloyd Garrison, his famous liberator, so he's white. Um, she's very influential over both. She speaks to mixed audiences at a time where that's really not acceptable. That's like really radical. Not just men and women, but also black and white. Um, and people label her thusly as promiscuous. This is not promiscuous in terms of sexual promiscuity, but promiscuous in terms of undiscerning, right? Undiscerning in what you do. So she's not She's being careless, effectively, with her actions, with her audiences. And this is interesting because you see, right, this word promiscuous, which is used around sex frequently, to um, really denigrate, right, denigrate, the origin of the word being to make black, right, denigrate. So, like, to denigrate this black woman, right, in her activism, right, they use this kind of sexually charged word of promiscuous. And uh, there's similar um, usage of the word uh, prostitute, right? So women who would be working out in public, uh, selling, you know, things that they bake, working class women, going to work, selling things in a market. Um, in the mid 19th century, it would be common to say that women were prostituting themselves, right? the making money in the public sphere. So we see this kind of like overlap between female ambition and female independence and this notion of sexual promiscuity or to use an anachronistic phrase, sex work, right, or prostitution, right? So again, interesting how, how is this movement vilified? How is this movement pushed back against? And one of them is, right, kind of sexually, right, or sexually charged language. Um, so Mariah um, Stewart is first, but we have kind of like we have kind of uh, whitewashed, I suppose, the historical record because the big one and this is the big one, right? Like like ding, 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 like got to know this for the exam type stuff. Seneca Falls, 1848. This is the beginning of what we would call first wave feminism. Um, women, largely upper middle class white women um, demanding a vote right? Um, suffrage. So that's first, that's first wave feminism. They pen the Declaration of Sentiments. It's modeled on the Declaration of Independence. Um, and this is kind of women kind of coming out, as it were, demanding suffrage. Um, the uh, women in charge of or responsible for uh, the uh, Seneca Falls Convention, Stanton and Mott in particular, actually do work with abolitionists, Right, advocating for the abolition of slavery and suffrage. But as we get at, in the post-Civil War world, you see a break because 
both groups start advocating for their own cause, right? The, the um, suffrage for uh, women, white women, or suffrage for black men, and you have a break between the, um, those two groups. Um, as I said in class, right, the, the, this group, so we've seen the promiscuity, the prostitution, the use of sexually charged language to marginalize these movements. Another common rhetorical trope is to say that they're nonsense, they're crazy, right, they're childish. So there's a way of infantilizing um, or delegitimizing, right, women's demands uh, through language of superiority, right, um, uh, kind of patriarchal superiority. And you compare that to the you, the words that are used to, again, denigrate, to make black or to like mark uh, as uh, bad. Um, the abolitionist movement, it's always threatening, revolutionary, radical, right? So you see the ways in which like anti-black racism is used to denigrate the uh, abolitionist movement and kind of uh, sexist or misogynist language to demean women is used to marginalize the women's movement, right? And you won't see the two, you, you very rarely see the two kind of cross over. Um, all right, let's get through this thing, man. I'm taking my, my merry time here. Uh, the Civil War. Um, farms, just like in the Revolutionary War, women fill in for men who are off to war. We see the same thing happening in the Civil War. Um, uh, with husbands and sons gone, women take up these roles, further empowering themselves, further right, pushing beyond the traditional boundaries of what a woman can or should or ought to do. Um, in cities, we see women going into wage labor, um, jobs like, you know, kind of desk jobs for educated upper class women, right? You need penmanship, you need to be able to write, to read, to spell. Um, and for working class women, more kind of dangerous or less desirable jobs, munitions factories, morgues, stuff like that. But again, we see women entering into kind of all kinds of new roles in the Revolutionary War. In the Civil War, we see that as well. What's different is the prominence of wage labor. Right, which isn't as prominent during the revolution. Um, this empowerment, this wartime empowerment, has women pushing for more rights um, in the post-Civil War world. Um, this is mostly in the North. Conservative South goes back to um, their pre-war roles and also um, the notion that white women needed to be protected um, primarily from black men, right? This kind of, um, this myth right, of black, either enslaved men before the war or free blacks after the war were um, somehow like, you know, sexual predators or something like that, a common racist anti-black uh, trope in the South. So women, white women get kind of very much pushed back into their domestic roles uh, in the South. Um, this is all white women, right? So enslaved women, um, it's a very different thing, right? Enslaved women are very much rooted to the areas, right? The kind of labor camps that they're um, uh, enslaved on. Um, they can't leave because they're responsible for taking care of children or taking care of elderly family members. It's usually, oh, sorry, I'm covering up here. Um, uh, it's usually elderly uh, family members who, um, uh, or women who are in charge of taking care of elderly family members and kids. Um, other highlights you see here again the image of like this is this is this is Colombia Colombia with a U not Colombia with a O right feminine virtue this is Republican motherhood feminine virtue purity uh, the kind of uh, very white right image of um, American feminine the the virtues that America has that are the kind of soft virtues as opposed to the kind of Uncle Sam type images. This is the imaginary, um, but then we have real women, right, advocating for real causes. As I said, the um, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Seneca Falls, um, uh, asking for the right to uh, um, uh, to vote. Um, Catherine Beecher, education, um, also Elizabeth Blackwell. Uh, Dorothea Dix with prison reform. The interesting thing with Beecher, Dix, and Blackwell is that what they're doing is their advocacy is rooted in notions of what women should be doing, 
right? Republican motherhood, education. Um, uh, with prison and uh, prison reform and asylum reform, it's that women should be taking care of or right, being selfless, being generous, lifting up the downtrodden, right? So, so the kind of educational activism and the prison and asylum activism is very much tapping into preconceived notions of what women should be doing, where like abolition and suffrage do not, right? Because abolition and suffrage, it's not about what women are best at in the domestic sphere. It's about women should be outside of the domestic sphere, advocating for the enslaved in the public sphere, um, demanding the vote or voting in the public sphere. So those are the more radical kind of activist stances, right? Um, Sojourner Truth, obviously, um, uh, black abolitionist, and then Harriet Beecher Stowe, white abolitionist. Um, suffrage, property rights, Victoria Woodhull, and Susan B. Anthony, just the kind of highlights here. Um, female reformers in the progressive era, here's another kind of famous image I talked about in a couple sections today, right? This is an image again of the same, there's that woman again, right? Um, uh, uh, in the kind of toga, right? This is the symbol of Columbia, right? Feminine virtue. Um, and standing in the West, um, because that's where women get the vote first is in the West. And you have kind of these, you know, teeming masses of women in the East, you know, looking to, right, the awakening, looking to Columbia, right, to uh, awaken their political consciousness. Um, uh, this movement West, obviously, a lot of Western states give women the right to vote to encourage migration of families and to encourage settler colonialism in the area in this, a similar way to what um, then Western states States in the 1830s, like say Illinois, um, did with respect to uh, getting rid of property requirements, also encouraged migration right to the Western uh, states. Again, Western at that point in time. Um, the Progressive Era is known as a time of like as we talked about, uh, muckraking journalism is a big thing, exposing um, uh, unjust, uh, activities or raising, really raising awareness. People use that term all the time nowadays where it's like, I know about that. What are you talking about? Raising awareness. I know that like colon cancer, I know about breast cancer. You don't need to raise my awareness. You need to like raise money. You need to find a cure. Um, but in the 1880s, like it, nobody knows about what's happening in asylums. Nobody knows about the monopolistic practices about of Standard Oil. So it, like it is raising awareness, like legit. People didn't know about it, and now they do. Um, Nellie Bly with 10 Days in a Madhouse. You can obviously judge this book by the cover. Um, it's a kind of undercover expose of the really inhumane conditions that existing in asylums. Um, sadly, mental health uh, facilities are still... Uh, abysmal, medieval even, in their um, standards of care. Um, Ida Tarbell exposes the uh, monopolistic practice of the Standard Oil Company, very influential uh, over the kind of legislation, anti-monopoly legislation that's passed by Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and others of the late 19th century. Jane Adididididums, um, Hull House, the mother of social work. Um, she is someone who's helping newly arrived immigrant women kind of um, uh, 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 acculturate, get used to American culture. Um, Elaine Swallows Richards, Richards or Richardson? Richards or Richardson? I can't move it, move my thing here. Um, Elaine Swallows Richards, I think, um, is home economics. So if you'll remember Taylorism, Taylorism, right? So let's start with Fordism. Fordism, you know, is the assembly line. Tonk, 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 tonk. Worker doing that, one menial, one task all day long. Taylorism is not that. Taylorism is a bunch of workers sitting at tables and say we're all putting watches together and Frederick Taylor's going to time us and whatever the fastest technique is, we're all going to do that, right? So we're kind of like almost cyborg-like and that we're all moving in a similar way because it's the most efficient way. Um, that scientific approach, that rational approach to labor in the public sphere is then used by women like Elaine Swallows Richards. I can't think if it's Richards or Richardson, and I think that maybe the thing is over her name. Um, uh, maybe it's, I think it is just Richards, but I'm kind of paranoid about having the, the O-N covered up. Anyway, she takes that logical approach and applies it to women's work in the home, right? This is where we see the advent of, of cookbooks with actual measurements, right? Like, so instead of like, take a, um, uh, piece of, uh, a butter the size of an egg, 
it says take like a two right tablespoons of butter, two level tablespoons, right? What, when you say the size of an egg, what do you mean? A quail egg, um, a duck egg, what kind of egg? So this is women using that same, remember progressive era, like rationality, empiricism, applying that to women's labor in the home. Uh, Margaret Sanger, as I've said, number one killer of women, childbirth. Um, and this is a big deal, birth control, the advent of Planned Parenthood, very, very progressive, gives women, right, the ability to actually have sovereignty over their own bodies, like sovereignty, independence, freedom, something we are very much like a big on in the United States of America. And it says that like you, you also can have this, this freedom, this sovereignty, this independence, right, over your own body, and you don't have to die in childbirth, or you don't have to be, right, taking care of, you know, child after child after child after child. Um, that's great, but Margaret Sanger has the, um, unenviable uh, label of being a complicated historical figure um, because, well, she is um, an advocate of birth control, and that's great. She is also an advocate for, like, controlling the births of newly arrived immigrants, which is to say, like, they shouldn't have any, um, and, you know, uh, advocates of sterilization and things like that. So, like, again, a product of her time, to be sure, because that is the cutting-edge science of the time period is racist pseudoscience uh, and she certainly has these two sides right to her advocacy um, ida b wells someone who is speaking out against lynching in a time where she is really one of the lone voices in a period that is marked by and by very brutal anti-black violence in the south um okay so two things that women have been asking for for a very very long time is temperance Right, an end to el the use of alcohol because um, alcohol was abused in a major, major way from the early republic on. Right, all of these farmers growing apples and corn. It's not like they're just you know making apple pies and eating corn on the cob. They're distilling, right, these things, and there's a lot of drinking going on, a lot, a lot, a lot, and that is very destructive for home life. Right, so temperance has been a cause that women have been advocating for really, really since the beginning. Of, of American history. And then suffrage also, citing Abigail Adams, don't forget the ladies, right, also something that women have been pushing for for a very long time. And they get two big wins in 1919-1920 with the 18th Amendment prohibition and then the 19th Amendment, which is um, recognizing the right to vote th across the nation, right? So that's, that's, that's the biggest win you can get in right American history in some ways is a constitutional amendment. Uh, and they get those wins in 1919-1920. Um, as someone pointed out in class, uh, the 1920-19th Amendment was a very good point, actually, as I thought about it later. Um, largely, the kind of push over the, the, the finish line here is because women going to work in defense industries during World War I. So yet again, women taking on more roles um, outside of the home uh, gives them the kind of momentum to move into the post-war world saying like, look, we can do anything. We can do all the stuff that men can do. And we've done all the stuff that men can do. So we should have the right to, to vote. Um, women in the city moving into like the 1920s um, uh, now here. Um, gender, gender roles are things for men and for women. And in the 1920s in cities, you see a lot of gender roles changing. Um, for women, it's because the traditional gender role is, right, housewife, mother, um, uh, in the domestic sphere, kind of um, 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 as a symbol of virtue, purity, etc. Well, now women can like, they can vote, which is new. They can make money, right, which we saw like that in all the way back to the Lowell system. But now it's like they can also make money like in non-exploitative uh, industries. They can live on their own or live with other women in boarding houses. They can take control of their own bodies with, right, uh, um, uh, birth control. So, like, this is a major shift in gender roles in the sense that, like, women aren't, like, subservient 
uh, and um, and tied to the home anymore. Like that's a big change in gender roles, and certainly you know, one could argue it's a change for the good, uh, right? Um, the Shepherd Towner Act actually provides at a federal level, right? Provides prenatal care, so even if you're having children, uh, you have uh, some level of security, right? That you're you're going to have uh, the proper kind of medical care for your babies, because again, infant mortality very very high. Um, a lot of this, as it was with Republican motherhood, a lot of these gender, uh, uh, these changing gender roles are for white women and upper middle class white women uh, in particular. Uh, immigrant women are also changing gender roles, but only insofar as like they have to leave and like work in factory jobs and things like that, right? So like they're, they're, they can't adhere to traditional fen uh, gender roles by, um, by necessity. Um, it's not just for um, uh, women though, right? Men's gender roles are also changing. So again, in the revolutionary generation or really if we're talking the 1920s, even 1870s, right? What it means to be a man is to be a, a provider for your family, right? To often work in, in agricultural labor, right? With your hands, producing the food, right? Maintaining, right? You're, you're being independent, maintaining your own independence. Well, now, like, what does it mean when you, you work at a desk all day and some other man is telling you what to do? Right, that's a crisis in masculinity, and that also is something that we see in the 1920s. Again, in cities, still are, people are still having traditional gender roles in the country, but in cities, these things are changing and they're changing quickly. Um, sexuality also um, is in cities where there's a degree of you're not tied to your community. Your you know people don't your family isn't there. People are more free to explore their actual sexuality, right? So we have a more public, visible display of uh, gay sexuality for men and for women and gender bending and all this kind of stuff. We don't really have the language of like trans yet in the 1920s, but certainly we can look back at the historical record and go like, oh yeah, absolutely, right? That like there were some actually well-known performers that were very much kind of lived their lives effectively in, in drag. Um, so all of that is happening in cities. Fast forward to the World War II, and then the post-war world, we have very different ideas of what a woman can do, what a woman should do, from um, the Rosie the Riveter, right, um, flexing um, on, uh, uh, well, Nazis, I suppose, but also like anyone who thinks a woman can't do this stuff, uh, to uh, the right image at right of the kind of traditional 1950s um, housewife. Uh, and that, again, um, is a, a period that, a, a transition that happens pretty quickly. So the War Production Board, right, really encourages Americans to, uh, um, uh, well, the, the Americans who are not gone off to war should go into work, and largely these are women um, entering the labor forces. And uh, just like during World War One just like during the Civil War, uh, doing jobs that men had formerly done. It's very empowering for them. Famous women who have prominent public uh, uh, roles at this time, obviously Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the first lady to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, she is unique because she's we, we take it as a given in the modern kind of political world that like first ladies are politically and socially active. They're not just like women who sit, at, they sit in the White House. Um, and Roosevelt really is the first to do that, right? So, so Eleanor Roosevelt is a very kind of has a strong voice and influence over FDR and really takes on her own uh, political and social tasks in, in, in a way that a lot of them are more radical than Roosevelt. Certainly on issues of race, she's far more... Um, uh, uh, f far ahead of Roosevelt in issues of equality between, say, black and white. Frances Perkins, Secretary of Labor, first female cabinet member. Um, in the post-war world, the, the kind of ebullience of the victory of the Allies and the economic boom leads to the growth of suburbs. Um, that ideal suburban lifestyle leads to uh, a growing kind of conservatism, obviously with anti-communism also. Um, and then we do get a, a, a return to traditional gender roles right after World War I here. And you see here, this is just a chart of the baby boom here. You see, so you see the years, right, 1950 to, um, 
right? Like 50 to 70, kind of that's where the big bump is there. So again, these are not women who are, I mean, obviously they're, these were women who are choosing, right, to have children, um, but it's not a, uh, a breaking of gender roles at a kind of national wide uh, spread level. Second wave feminism. Um, so first wave feminism, Seneca Falls, um, uh, Lucretia Mott, Stanton, right to vote, demand, suffrage. Uh, second wave feminism emerges in the 1960s into the 1970s. And this is not just women saying we want the right to vote, but we, we have identities that are not just tied to who we are as daughters as sisters and as mothers, right? We have our own identities. We want to cultivate our own identities. We want to pursue, pursue education to give us more options. Um, um, we want to uh, have careers of our own. Uh, and this is where it's second wave feminism because first wave feminism isn't asking for, right, like job security. It's saying we we're fine being kind of Republican mothers, but we want to be able to vote. Where this is very different, it's about women entering into the workplace, uh, women pushing back against sexist uh, and misogynist kind of like violence, behaviors and attitudes, asking for uh, more and expanded reproductive rights. So all of this stuff is either, right, Betty Friedan, most famously in the things I've gone through in both her feminine mystique and then also as uh, a member and founder of the National Organization of Women. And then Gloria Steinem, a kind of other well-known like um, a feminist a female publisher, starts Ms. Magazine, is very successful in that. So this is all 1960s type stuff. Um, the peak of the women's rights movement, right, we see 63, Equal Pay Act, 1964, Civil Rights Act. Civil Rights Act bans discrimination, not just on the basis of race, but also sex, right? So there is a kind of, it's not just a win for African Americans, but also for women. Um, Equal Pay Act uh, is signed by JFK which, um, right, equal pay for equal uh, labor. Um, 1972, Title IX, which requires, right, equal opportunities for women in sports, um, in athletic programs, uh, in public school, and then in college. So, like, effectively, like, a... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, equal protection of women's rights, right, in educational settings and then by extension in the public sphere. Roe v. Wade obviously is a huge victory for the women, a woman's right to choose, a woman's uh, ability to have sovereignty over her own body. Um, and it's right, I've, as we know, right, has been contested ever since uh, in the United States. Um, maternity leave is something that women also push for. Um, but right, just as we say civil rights was not a win across the board, civil rights in a lot of ways lost a lot of its more ambitious demands. Um, similarly, um, uh, the demands for maternity leave, as we see here, the United States is way out of step. Um, with the rest of the uh, developed world in terms of actually um, uh, 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 um, uh, providing for women um, who uh, are pregnant and who are nursing. Uh, so again, it is a long way from Republican motherhood to Roe v. Wade, um, but uh, as civil rights is always an unfinished project, um, and those battles, as we uh, well know, are being fought even as we speak, right, uh, in 2021. Uh, similarly, um, the uh, uh, full equality for women uh, is also an ongoing fight and one that is um, we can continue to fight uh, in 2021.